second session of the illegal, unreported, and unregulating fishing conference that is being uh, sponsored by U.S. Southcom and Florida International University, the J. Gordon Institute of Public Policy. Thank you so much for being with us. My name is Luis Solis. I am the current interim director of the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center, and I'm also the former president of Costa Rica. This is a conference that was called to amplify, to study the amplification of uh, the amplifying impacts of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, identifying the networks and the problems, uh, and also the uh, likelihood of controlling this phenomenon, forms to, to counter IUFF by identifying concrete actions, good practices, and lessons learned from different uh, experts. From, uh, from, from institutions, uh, public and private around, around the world. Please share your thoughts on social media using the hashtag at F-I-U-F-C-O-N, CON 2021. And also remember that we have translation available into Spanish and Portuguese. If you so desire, please uh, check, click on the interpretation icon and choose the language of your preferences. You are also welcome to view this uh, panel through Facebook streaming, uh, but not note that it will not be translated. Um, and um, I also want to recall you that the final panel of this conference will conference will begin at 12.15. So you can stay, stay right here uh, and you don't have to leave the stream. So, uh, you can uh, you can also refer to the email you received this morning to 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 uh, access that third session. Uh, I'm very honored to present uh, the uh, persons who are going to be joining us as panelists in, in this event. Uh, Amanda Nixon is the director of international fisheries at Pew Charitable Trusts. Herman Pochet is a Costa Rican environmental law specialist managing partner for BioUris and member of the Board of Biologists and National Bar of Attorneys of Costa Rica. Jonathan Turner is the co-founder and director of NLA International, a blue economy solutions company. And Mario Alcaide is a senior analyst of Interpol Global Fisheries Enforcement. So with this extraordinary group of experts, we will begin our panel session of this morning. I am going to allow them to make a, an opening statement in which they will frame the major points they would like to cover during their uh, different interventions along the panel. And then I hope we will have a very lively discussions between you and them. So please, if you want to post your questions or comments, please do so in the questions and answers icon in the bottom of your screen. Amanda, thank you very much for being us, uh, being with us. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Solis, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and thank you for very much for the invitation to speak at this uh, important conference today. Certainly the first panel uh, was an indication of the level of expertise and interest in this topic, and it's um, a great honor to be able to continue this discussion. To kick off, for those unfamiliar, the Pew Charitable Trust is a US-based nonprofit um, we employ close to a thousand people and have a mission that involves applying an evidence-based approach to improve public policy. We have over 40 active programs and projects, including internationally, on topics as diverse as biomedical research, U.S. infrastructure, higher education, economic mobility, and the environment. I give you that introduction in part to demonstrate my next point, which is how delighted we are to see a conference that looks at the broader consequences of illegal, unreported and unregulated or IUU fishing, as this is exactly the approach that we take. Um, there is often an assumption in our experience that an effort such as ours is focused solely on ensuring that fish stay in the ocean, rather than the challenge of achieving strong and effective maritime governance. And I wanna frame this a little differently in terms of looking at this issue in this session and discuss a little bit what we think the real issues and opportunities are in this area. So some of this was covered a little bit uh, in the first panel, but I wanna come back to the point that 
Um, wild caught fish is the single largest renewable protein resource on the planet. And we're looking at a time in history at the moment where in 2020, 132 million people, additional people entered what is called food poverty. So addressing IUU has socioeconomic and security impacts in addition to those related to environmental sustainability, not least because every fish that is caught from an IUU perspective is a fish that is not caught from a legal perspective or from a responsible actor. So IUU fishing operations, as we've heard, and as I uh, emphasize here, are rarely limited to stealing fish. The next point, which I think is particularly important, is that IUU is an indicator um, and a result of weak governance. IUU fishers and other criminal operators can and do exploit the gaps and overlaps in, governments, in governance that allow these activities to occur or enable these activities to occur. Fisheries governance itself is a mass of overlapping jurisdictional arrangements that have largely been based over time on the allocation of catches. And with the growth of technology and vessels, um, fish, fishing operations can move further and faster than current management arrangements um, allow and faster than enforcement can follow. And when you consider that in addition to that, and this was also touched on in the first panel, we have highly subsidized industrial fleets operating in or close to the waters of countries with large EEZs, with stretched surveillance capacity and limited coordinated intelligence sharing, it really puts local fleets at a distinct disadvantage. The good news here, I think, is that there are solutions and that it's exciting to see the beginning of these solutions being discussed at a higher level. The, the bottom line is that solutions are cooperative and they're based in overall improvements to maritime domain governance. So just as IUU operates in a multi-jurisdictional way, so must the international response. And uh, I wonder if you could put up my slide at this point with the summary pieces on there. Thank you. Um, so, oh, whoops. Um, so fundamentally, there are three pieces to what we see as important solutions. First is flag state responsibility. So it really is important to look at the responsibility of flag states and make sure that they are taking the appropriate actions to um, act as the overseers of vessels which fly their flag. This means sharing vessel data when they operate in other countries EEZs, but especially on the high seas um, where the flag state is really the only one that can hold a vessel accountable. Second is that more states absolutely need to become parties to and implement the Port State Measures Agreement. Um, this is an agreement that works um, most effectively when uh, there are multiple contiguous coastal states all agreeing to close ports to illegal fishers and making it clear that uh, a landing illegal fish um, is unacceptable. Implementing effective port state measures will require cooperation of many different departments, even within a single government, um, and information exchange really is the heart of the success there. Finally, beneficial ownership also touched on in an earlier session. It's really important to know who ultimately benefits from um, illegal activities. It's one thing to go after an individual vessel, but you really only get the crew, and as was outlined earlier, um, they're really often the victims as well. If we're able to take that prosecution up the chain and look at the person or people who profit from illegal activities, it would absolutely change the nature of how we can improve maritime domain governance. So these together would deliver significant cooperative capacity and offer opportunities to share intelligence and analytics that would greatly improve oversight um, and perhaps most importantly would have concurrent security, environment, economic, and social benefits. Um, so uh, Chair, I will I'll leave my opening comments there and look forward to uh, further lively discussion after the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. Amanda Nixon is the Director of International Fisheries at the Pew Charitable Trusts. And now we go to Herman Pochet, who is the Costa Rican Environmental Law Specialist today. Uh, he's a, a, a well-known specialist on this matter and a very, uh, devoted researcher. I, I know him from, from our common uh, 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 nationality. So Herman, the floor is your, yours. You're, you're muted. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. 
Good morning, ex-president Mr. Solis, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for my invitation in this activity. It's very interesting for me to participate in this academic activity. When we speak about the scope of IUU fishing, we refer to impact uh, to the impact on the sustainability of fishing resource, food security, sovereignty of a resource, security at sea, and many other factors as well, alarming social problems such as human trafficking. Due to this reason, the state have formally agreed that UU fishing must be prevented and eliminated. To combat and discourage it, the state must take action and active their mechanisms relative to vigilance, control, and sanctions. Coordination with the partner nations is important to achieve this goal as well. Whenever a case of IUU fishing is detected, sanctions must be imposed on the infringer. The state public policy must search the well-being of the people, in this case, to combat against IUU fishing, must be done through gradual and integral action. Such measures have to take into account the different challenges regarding the issue. <clears throat> I consider that Costa Rica is an interesting case to share with you, due the importance of the social approach that is expected from the state. IUU fishing in Costa Rica has to be discussed from two different perspectives, attending to different realities. On the one hand, we have the situation of the small scale fishermen. And on the other hand, we have the reality regarding to the long liner fishermen and international tuna vessels. Maybe you can show the first uh, images of the presentation, please. Um, according to OSPESCA, that is the organization of Central America, the, the Another one, please. This is the, the non, the, yes. This is the, in the map of Costa Rica with the waters. And in this case, the, the blue points around the coast. This is the area where the, the small scale fishing uh, make the activity of the fishery. According to the OSPESCA, OSPESCA is the organization of Central America of the fishery. Costa Rica has approximately 15,000 artisanal fish, and only 1,500 of them have a fishing license. The fact that the most of the other uh, 13,500 fishermen are dependent on the activity to earn and living is an essential factor to consider when tackling the issue of IUU fishing. The small scale fishing is allowed in the first five mil miles from the coast on the both the Pacific and the Caribbean coast. The small scale fishing also includes men and women who capture mollusks and beach, beaches and mangroves. Therefore, the state's decision and public policy Addressing the fight against IUU fishing must consider the human rights of the, all of these people. The desire to combat the IUU fishing without sacrificing the respect of human dignity, the alimentation of the people, and their culture has forced the state to consider a process aimed at the normalization of the activity of these fishermen. On the other hand, please uh, show me the another. Uh, map, please. On the other hand, Costa Rica has 350 long-line fishing vessels. All of them have license and registry in Costa Rica. These fleets fishes mainly in Costa Rica waters and is aimed towards tuna, mahi-mahi, swordfish, and incidentally, uh, by catch uh, sharks. Costa Rica sea territory is 11 times bigger than the, its land area, and there are many allegations against foreign tuna vessels 
that fishing in Costa Rica waters without license. These complaints have been very ineffective and have not yielded a significant consequence. It is fundamental to consider that a single tuna vessel shot in one say, shot it has the capacity to capture the same amount of the fish that is extracted by the national long line fleet throughout a whole year. Thus, it's essential to combat this source of IUU fishing. The reality and the social impact of, all, of both the small scale and the long line fishery are completely different, totally. It's necessary to distinguish them and to trade, to, to trade them according. I think that this academic discussion today can be useful in the decision make process to the state, to the government. Thank you very much. Thank you, Herman, for your opening remarks. And now we go uh, to Jonathan Turner, who is the co-founder and director of NLA International. Jonathan, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, President Solis. Thank you, uh, fellow uh, panelists here present today. And, and thank you very much for the wider delegation for, for joining and, and, uh, and showing your interest in this quite compelling topic. As President Solis has said, I am the uh, director and co-founder of a blue economy solutions company, NLA International. And we, we champion the implementation of blue economies using innovative technologies, tools, and processes to create sustainable ocean environments for the people and for the economies that depend upon them. Um, I, I, I've phrased it deliberately that way. Innovation is not just about uh, uh, technology, and it's certainly not uh, about technology in isolation. Innovation for, for me is, is the application of technologies, but also ideas and processes uh, in a way that, that has an impact. Uh, and, and in this instance, the impact of challenging uh, IUU fishing activity. So, so, I, so I think that that innovation can be applied to, to do several things on several fronts. Surely it's about raising an awareness of the issue. Surely it's about creating a demand for a better understanding of the sources of fish and the sustainability of those sources. And surely too, it's about the, the correct regulatory frameworks in which fishing uh, is conducted within the correct and uh, appropriate level of enforcement and monitoring mechanisms and capabilities as well. There is a, a, a huge and growing demand as, as, as Amanda has already alluded to, as, as you look at the world population growth statistics and you look at indeed some of Pew's own work suggesting that the population plateau of the planet will the population rather of the of the growth of the planet will plateau up at up, up at around 10 billion by by 2100 and so that growing need for protein sources those emerging millions of people who, who require protein will turn to the sea and we're seeing that now but let's let's not forget that um that iuu is you know in its purest sense an economic endeavor it's a business it, it while it's economically compelling to conduct IUU, it will persist. And if we are to reduce it, we must make it less economically compelling. And, and to do that, I think there is a huge space to apply innovation in many ways, as I say, uh, re increasing the demand for transparency and understanding where the fish comes from, uh, but also increasing the capability of, of nations standalone to be able to uh, understand what's going on in their waters which is inherently a challenge when the, the space of, of people's ex exclusive economic zones is so vast um, and resource can be very limited to patrol them. Uh, so so, so it's, a, it's key that, that, that the innovation is applied in that, in that domain and in that way to empower nations to do that, to give them an understanding, to give them the ability to share that understanding and to give them that opportunity to then, to then work together in a combined way to increase transparency. Um, what's heartening is innovation is allowing that to happen. The economic cost of being able to understand what's going on in the sea space is uh, reducing. There are wonderful new technologies and innovations being applied uh, to have effect and to increase understanding. And um, hopefully we'll have the opportunity to expand on, on some of those cutting edge ideas uh, throughout today's panel discussion. 
Thank, thank you very much, Jonathan. Amanda, let's let's uh, go back to you because we have two opening questions for you directly from our audience. And, and I think they're very pertinent to what we've been talking about. One has to do with your reference to flag states and uh, it comes from Gohar Petrosian. And he says, how does one hold flag states who operate open registries responsible for allowing IUU vessels register under their flags? This indeed is a serious facilitator of IUU fishing, but seems to have been impossible to address property to date. And then Laura Van Voorhees, uh, says, uh, asks you, how will the new Corporate Transparency Act help with addressing beneficial owners issues mentioned? She works with the Bureau of International Labor Affairs in the U.S. Department of Labor. I think very interesting couple of questions for you to, uh, to ponder on. Thank you very much. I think the to address, I think looking at the issue of flag states first, flag state responsibilities don't exist in just one place. And so that's one of the reasons this is an area that needs a bit of work. Flag state responsibilities exist in a number of different ways across international um, and domestic requirements. Um, it's one real success story in looking at how a flag state can be held accountable is to look at the EU IUU regulation. Um, the process of the EU actually requiring um, some sort of oversight and investigation of whether or not flag states are actually um, carrying out their responsibilities is one really concrete example of a step forward uh, towards um, improving the oversight of flag states. But I think the first critical point on this front is to actually start to um, investigate and be clear about what exactly flag state responsibilities are in and of themselves. And we could certainly talk a little bit more about that after the other speakers, if you would like. Um, secondly, on the, the Corporate Transparency Act, um, this, this really this is a quite specific question. So uh, a, a short and, and hopefully specific enough answer. The Corporate Transparency Act basically um, takes this simple and reasonably effective step to require corporations and limited liability companies to disclose to law enforcement and others who are involved in uh, legally mandated um, anti-corruption activities information about who actually ultimately um, benefits from um, the ownership of uh, any particular entity at the at, at its kind of beginning point. And in that way, it sort of starts to specifically get at the issue of what is the beneficial owner, the requirement for that disclosure. So I, I think it's a good step um, in the right direction in terms of being able to actually see if we go to um, Jonathan's comments, the money trail that leads directly back to who is fundamentally making money from illegal and regulated unreported fishing. Um, Chair, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. And on that note, let me go now, having cleared these two questions, to Mario Alcaide, uh, another uh, of our guest speakers today, who is the criminal intelligence officer at uh, in Interpol. Mario, please uh, give us your opening remarks and your take on this, uh, uh, which uh, we welcome very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'll start by uh, by saying uh, so. Good afternoon to everyone, and and I hope that you are all safe wherever you are uh, in the world right now uh, during these troubling times. Thank you, President, for for this opportunity and to FIU to to present uh, uh, Interpol's uh, perspective and and work in 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 this area. Um, I will try to do a brief introduction and leave then the rest for the Q&A uh, section, which will be uh, a lot more interesting, I'm sure. Um, I would like to kick off this uh, contact with you uh, as for some of the, the, the participants, probably it will be the first uh, time that they will contact with Interpol. And therefore, um, uh, probably uh, there is to be uh, kind of a framing, why is Interpol involved in illegal fishing? And I would uh, like uh, if you could put the, on the, the slide, please. I think it's Kate. Um, so we, um, the way we see it, it it's um, we, we refer to the uh, the illegal fishing in itself. It's it's a bit like the image of a, of an iceberg, where uh, the illegal fishing being just the visible part of, of, of it, uh, whereas the biggest mass of the um, of uh, of, of this of the iceberg is actually beneath the water in a way from our look. So if you can click it, I think it will work. 
Great. And as you can see there, I think I like the, the idea of the, uh, the iceberg because it gives a clear uh, uh, idea of what we meant by this. So beneath the water or hidden as enabling crimes for the illegal fishing, you, need, you have the document fraud, human trafficking, counter of origin, labor exploitation, protected species, tax evasion, abuse of registry, and all cemented by uh, and we shouldn't be aware, uh, afraid of words by corruption. Corruption is the common ground between all those uh, uh, all those uh, crimes. And as uh, out of these crimes, I will touch upon just two because we feel that they are uh, key uh, to uh, to the problem or to sort it out the problem. One of them being obviously the abuse of the registration and the fraudulent documentation used. Um, some, of the, some of you that are not probably so familiar with law enforcement in the maritime domain uh, would be uh, surprised to know that currently in the 21st century there are still agencies uh, that uh, upon port arrival uh, they will uh, trust in copies, black and white copies of uh, the documents of the, of the vessel, whether they are registry or fishing license. This is a major issue. Uh, and the only way actually uh, to uh, raise their awareness on the importance of this fact is sometimes to compare those documents uh, uh, to the personal documents, to the passport. So I often say, what would happen to me if I pop up in your, uh, in your airport with a copy of my passport, black and white copy, to cross your border and get into your country? And then that's the like moment where they realize, well, no, it's not possible. So why do you... Uh, allow uh, the a vessel to come in with a copy of a passport. The other element, and has been here raised uh, quite uh, very detailed by Jan Urbina and his extended work uh, regarding this, it's the human factor. And there we have found very worrying situations around this. I'm talking about the, the control of the crew lists versus the passports or Siemens book on board versus the physical persons existing on board. In our experience that showed us, and I give you just three examples, that there are some mind blowing uh, um, situations where we have found a number of passports corresponding to the number of persons, but some of them were fraudulent. Meaning that the persons that the authorities were controlling were actually not those that uh, correspond on the crew list. Then we have found less passports than the number of peoples on board. So this means that there would be undocumented people on board. And why would you have undocumented people? And then more passports, and this is one of the most worrying, more passports than people found on board. So meaning there is people missing. Where are these people? So this is part of the invisibility of the, that Ian Urbino was mentioned about these people working, uh, uh, these persons working uh, in a very fragile situation on board these vessels for many, many years. Um, having said that, and if you want to wrap up, what would be the biggest problem uh, in here? And uh, probably the lack of interagent cooperation in the lack of international cooperation. And I remark here the comment made by uh, Madam Ambassador Jen Mains talking about these agreements in Central America and Latin America, which sounds like music uh, to my ears to, 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 to know about uh, this, uh, this uh, moving forward with these agreements, but they need to be cooperation, but they need to be effective and in a timely manner. And this, this has been quite often uh, a problem more often than it should, uh, because the reactions they need to uh, occur in uh, in due time. Otherwise, they will be ineffective. The cooperation will be ineffective, and uh, the instruments exist out there. Posted measures, UNTOC, so the United Nations Transnational Organized Crime, uh, the Convention of Palermo, uh, well known, and uh, or even the Interpol uh, National Center bureaus to connect at operational level between countries. They exist, but they simply, that's our perception at least, they are not applied, they are not used. And to paraphrase one, uh, one uh, uh, very remarkable and uh, 
um, American, uh, that is a reference for me, Abraham Lincoln, laws without enforcement are nothing but just good advices. <laughs> and and uh, I, I truly believe in that. And, um, and, and that's why uh, we need to put the mouth where our words are. And, but however, the problem is actually, in fact, a little bit more broader and goes behind fisheries. It's, it's linked with this issue of the concept of the maritime domain awareness, uh, or as I like to call it, sea blindness. Sea blindness is nothing more in a nutshell, it's just uh, uh, the, lack, uh, uh, the lack of uh, maritime, uh, uh, maritime culture and governance in the maritime domain. And um, how do we cope with this? Well, simply by aligning the strategic goals of each of every agency that has a role in the maritime domain with the, with the, with the goals and, uh, of their own country. Um, and uh, if, um, uh, if you allow me uh, a concrete measure and not to remain so, uh, uh, so, so vague, and because this was already referred on the previous panel, quite often by the, even by the, 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 the admiral, uh, just make sure all of you that have functions in the port, uh, as a port authorities during port calls, just make sure that the AIS will be switched off, switched on, at least when the vessels are in port. The reason being is that if we or anyone else is looking for a vessel because they have perpetrated some whatever crime in elsewhere, we'll have, once they switch on, the AIS will be able to immediately and through our uh, network of uh, national center bureaus, we immediately uh, are able to, uh, at the same time, to reach out to these countries, ask for support, seize the vessel, detain the vessel until further, uh, until further notice. And with this, I end up my intervention, hoping that uh, uh, this will trigger more discussion now in the Q&A and hoping that uh, I have earned the privilege of your time. Oh, thank things. you, Mario. I think I think it will trigger discussion. I'm no uh, absolutely sure about that. And thank you for that very illustrative film uh, that you 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 uh, presented because I think it gives you a very good idea of how complex IUUF uh, is as an issue. Uh, Herman, let me ask you this. In uh, I think it is clear. Everybody agrees that IUUF is a threat to national sovereignty and in many ways, a threat to national security. But I would like to talk, uh, I would like you to refer to the, uh, the, the impact uh, in, in, in Central America in, in, and in the Western Hemisphere, because you've worked with small scale fishing communities throughout the Americas. What is the impact in the, in the, in the ecological sense and in the uh, development uh, sense of these communities? How is it that this seemingly so remote uh, events taking place in the high seas, uh, supposedly, where nobody sees them, the blindness that Mario referred to, affect real people in real communities along the coasts of our region. Herman, you're muted. Sorry, Ken. Me, me puede hacer la pregunta en español, por favor. Sí, con mucho gusto. I'm going to switch here to Spanish, but please remain in your channels because we cannot shift within the panel uh, from one language to the other. So I'm going to translate, and then if Germán decides to respond to Spanish, I'll try to interpret. Mi pregunta, Germán, tiene que ver con la afirmación de que este es un tema que afecta la soberanía de los estados. Eso está claro. Y que incluso puede ser considerado un tema de amenaza a la seguridad nacional pero quisiera que usted se refiera a la situación de las comunidades pesqueras eh, eh, de nuestra América Central y cómo ésta se ve afectada por eh, en, de temas de alimenticios, de, de acceso a, a, a recursos de, de, para el desarrollo por estas actividades de pesca eh, no reportada ilegal. Bueno, sin, sin duda nuestra región tiene una composición importante de pesca artesanal de pequeña escala. Our region has a very important small scale fishing uh, condition. Eh, esta pesca está sujeta a especies altamente migratorias 
y esto lo hace dependiente de que en otros países, ¿verdad? en las otras regiones, también se haga un buen manejo de los recursos pesqueros. It deals with highly migratory species and therefore requires from what happens in other, in other regions of the world. Entonces, la dependencia que nosotros tenemos que a nivel de la OROP, que es la Inter-American Tuna Commission, se tomen las medidas para el ordenamiento adecuado, tienen relación directa con el tema del manejo de, de, de las de la pequeña escala también. So whatever measures are taken and the Tuna Commission and others dealing with these resources have direct impact on, on small scale fishing. Y la participación de las eh, de la pesca artesanal de pequeña escala en conocer acerca de la pesca IUU es fundamental para también entrar en un proceso integral de construcción de soluciones. That the, 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 the linkage is therefore between IUUF and small scale fishing and artisanal fishing is essential to find a solution, an integral solution to the problem in Central America. Okay. Thank you, Herman. Okay, Jonathan, uh, we, we, we know that there has been a whole uh, effort, a big effort to incorporate technologies, new technologies into the controlling of this um, phenomenon of, of IU. UF. Uh, can you point at um, progress that has been made? We've been talking a lot about difficulties, problems, challenges of all sorts. Has there been progress? And can you point at a number of examples of things that have been done correctly in the use of technologies to, uh, to tackle these issues? Yeah, I think, I, I think fun, fundamentally, we've got, a, we've got a, an inherent issue in understanding what's going on at sea, because it is a huge space. So I'm gonna, I can talk about a couple of innovations or several innovations here that, that play in different dimensions. I think there's, a, there's and I'll, I'll talk about it if I may, from a technical point of view, but also from, a, from an innovation point of view, from a people perspective. And if I start with the people perspective, if you look at the way um, the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resource in the Philippines has established and supported the establishment of the Bante Daga. That's a, an organization of uh, fisher folk, a uh, hundred thousand people strong that, that operate within the waters of the Philippines. And they are the sea watchers. They are, they are um, citizens, they are fisher folk, but they monitor and have the ability to report what they see in terms of fisheries. Now, in different parts of the Philippines, they operate in different ways. In some places, they merely monitor. In other places, they'll make direct challenges when they see fleets or, or vessels operating in different ways. I think that's a tremendously powerful and a tremendously innovative way of gathering data about what's happening on the sea, just simply providing the conduit for information to be passed from all of those uh, literally thousands of eyes that are out there uh, operating at sea back through to central decision making teams so that that's a, that's an app for me as, a, as an example of innovation that's enabled by technology but is also enabled by empowering and involving people in in the domain in which they work and then if, if, if you look at technology more generally then the the way in which the new space phenomenon as a as a as a, as a global movement has allowed us to gather data from space, has, has changed the dynamic. You look at, I know, um, I think Tony Long uh, of Global Fishing Watch is, a, is, on a, is on a later panel and will probably, probably touch on, on the work that they've done. And they're not the only ones out there using uh, relatively newly accessible data sets in terms of uh, AIS tracking and synthetic aperture radar imagery gathering, optical, uh, optical imagery gathering from space. That data used to be you know, not just not just the, the data that governments could have, but only certain governments had because of the cost of achieving it. So you had to have a national space capability to be able to generate that data. The success story is that that data can now be obtained through online portals for relatively, not, not insignificant cost, but for relatively modest cost. You combine that data using, again, relatively accessible and, and increasingly prolific mechanisms such as artificial intelligence, the machine learning type mechanisms that people can, people can deploy. And you start to see that you can, you can fuse that data together and make quite substantial leaps forward in understanding what's happening at sea. I'm not saying in isolation that either of those two approaches 
completely eradicate the phenomenon of sea blindness that Mario's highlighted. I think sea blindness still persists, but the, the glimmer of hope, the light at the end of the tunnel is it, it, we, we're beginning to see that, that the application of innovations from a technology perspective, from a process perspective, and through the inclusion of people uh, is highlighting that what was once impossible to understand, and unless you were there on top of an issue happening within your sphere of horizon, within within your within your vessel monitoring a given sea space, it's broadened. We can see further, and we can see more, and we can record more, and we can analyze more. So, so I, I do I do want to to I'm sending that message as a message of hope, and 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 and, and a positive message. Traction is being made in those domains. Um, and there are, there are other examples of, of some really innovative things that are being, being done. To give a sort of a, a slightly uh, quirky example, uh, the, there was a, 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 a project run, um, I can't remember the name of it, a project run, at the, I think it was last year now, that used uh, very, very small uh, radio frequency detection devices uh, on uh, albatross, so actually mounted on wildlife. And those devices were placed on albatross and they covered some 40 million square kilometers of the Southern Ocean. And what those, those, those birds just flying around doing the things that albatross normally do, covering large sea spaces, they could detect radio frequency signals of vessels. Now, some of those vessels had their automatic identification systems turned off. And where there was a disparity between a radar signature from a vessel and a lack of corresponding automatic, automatic identification system, it flagged an issue. So, so, so innovative technology approaches in that regard also helped to, 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 to shine a light and to reveal the truth about what's really happening at sea. And that enables us ultimately to, to, to craft better decision-making based on, on facts and evidence. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amanda, would, would you, would you uh, rather, uh, would you like to comment on this, uh, on these examples and others you may have about the uh, positive use of technologies and other mechanisms like, you know, big data to, to uh, help the, the work of controlling IUF, IUUF? Thank you very much. To build very much on Jonathan's comments, I think, um, and reflecting on some of what I've seen come up in the Q&A there, I think we need to move past a notion that we don't have the technology um, available. In fact, we do. We're at a point now where the single biggest um, gap in this process is the linking of information um, and the development of intelligence-led approaches across jurisdictions. So for example, we, have, we know that there are multiple situations in which um, there, there's information that flag states hold that they are not following through on. We know that it's possible to actually acquire data sets um, and make use of those in new innovative analytical ways. And we know that with information sharing, we can follow a single vessel or potential actor across multiple ocean jurisdictions and be able to actually apprehend them. We have a tool called the Polish State Measures Agreement, which means that you have the right, if you are a member of that, to stop a vessel from entering your port. So at this stage, I think we're in this, um, we have riches in terms of, that we've not had before in terms of access to technology. And the challenge really is how do we link those uh, data points together in a way that can be particularly helpful. And as Jonathan uh, noted, certainly I think that uh, Global Fishing Watch and others can provide um, uh, clear uh, examples of this. One that I know that Pew has worked on with Global Fishing Watch, for example, was if you take um, information about where reported transshipments occur, and transshipment can be one of those places where you see opportunity for uh, illegal activities. And you compare that to um, an assessment and analysis of where transshipments were likely to have occurred based on vessel tracks, you can start to develop a better understanding of where it is that risk may be and how to employ surveillance and appropriate assets to address those risks. So I think the key point that I want to back up from Jonathan's uh, beginning there is that the need to link together and create cooperative approaches that allows intelligence-led um, action in relation to that data. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank, thank you, Amanda. Actually, I, I have a number of questions for Mario. For you, you really triggered a lot of discussions, Mario. Here, you know, with your intervention. So I would like you to comment on the technology 
issue because you, I suppose, use it a lot in, in your daily activities. But there are a couple of things. Bruce Vitter um, says that, uh, or asks, uh, uh, says the following, Admiral Schultz highlighted the increased effort by the U.S. Coast Guard in dealing with IUUF and the deployment of U.S. Coast National Guard security cutter to the Atlantic side of South America. In addition to the U.S. Coast Guard, Interpol has an effort for increased cooperation with Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, and the IMC's network. Can you provide some details on this effort? How is it different from the past? Is this something can, that can be replicated with other countries and using new technologies, for example? And then Marco Quesada uh, says that small scale fisheries in the world are not immune to organized crime, of course. Is it possible to resolve IAU fishing within national exclusive economic zones by addressing only the fishery dimension and not other criminal activities? This is a very interesting question. It's the other, the other way around. Can you uh, flip the, the iceberg around? Can you deal with all the other things uh, as a need in order to get to the IIUF? I think that's a fascinating uh, different perspective of the iceberg you presented. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the, the first question to Mr. Bruce Victor, if I capture well the, his name, uh, the issue of the, our cooperation and uh, our work in the South Atlantic. Uh, in conjunction with those three specific countries, plus uh, the U.S. through the, the Coast Guard and particularly the, the Cutter uh, uh, Stone, which is in the region. Um, what we are going to do is to provide enough support, analytical support to those, uh, to the, all the information collected out at sea by the, the, the vessel inspections and, and also from the port inspections. So there will be a, a dedicated effort um, during that period, uh, which will um, will uh, see significant resource from those countries dedicated to IEU. And then there are announced by the participation of the, uh, of the US Coast Guard cutter, which would be an uh, enormous help to the, the control of the waters around those countries. And particularly, if you, you allow me to announce the, 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 the squid fishery happening in, in the, right on the border of the Argentina EZ, uh, which you might want even to see it uh, uh, via uh, open source tools, where you'll see all, uh, an area more uh, lighted up, more bigger than Buenos Aires. Uh, and that's just the, the, the lights of the vessels. Regarding the organized crime, and I apologies, I forgot the name of the person that um, I couldn't capture the name. Uh, it's absolutely, it's a key element for us, in fact. Uh, actually, you are right. I put it there just as the, 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 the iceberg. It's how the general public sees it. What is beneath the water, that's how we see it. Okay, and when we... Uh, help countries to tackle specific, um, um, it will always start with a vessel. But we, what we always encourage those countries to go after is actually the network behind that vessel. Because let's be honest, a vessel, a rock vessel, particularly those rock vessels, those rusty, uh, and it costs what? One million euros, 1,000 uh, million euros, one, one, one million and a half uh, million euros. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about the Southern Ocean, for instance, the two fish fishery. One of those vessels would make two fishing trips per year in six months. Per fishing trip, they will make six million euros per fishing trip. So, you know, a vessel of one million, it's running costs. It's running costs. So the vessel in itself, it's not an issue for us. What we look, it's after the... the, the the, the structures behind it. And you have heard about some of the cases that were more uh, the Nika or the Andre Dol Golf that were stopped by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, Indonesia on behalf of, uh, of other countries. And, uh, and we are still working on them. And yet they have already stopped popping up in the news and in the media, but we are still working with countries tackling the rest of 
the 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 network behind that that uh, uh, that uh, behind that vessel, those specific vessels, and eventually will succeed. If you allow me, present. Although it was not part of your questions, but I would like just to uh, to pinpoint one of the issues. It's regarding the EIS. The EIS has been seen as, and we use it. And you're right, we use it uh, the technologies, and we use it AIS daily. I use it AIS daily. But I would like to highlight the constraints around the AIS. And here, you have to bear in mind that AIS is not a control tool. It's not a control tool. It was put it in set up, uh, put it in place by IMO uh, back in the 90s or late 90s um, to avoid collisions at sea. So it's primarily uh, uh, a tool for uh, safety to prevent safety. And actually in that respect, IMO is quite critical and uh, has quite a strong position regarding the dissemination of the AIS in the uh, World Wide Web. Uh, because the issue is, and most of the audience probably is familiar with, it's these days, the bad actors are actually now playing it, playing with it. So they are, uh, for instance, identity fraud, pretending that they are the vessel A instead of vessel B, uh, position spoofing, saying instead of being in uh, West Africa, actually they were in Somalia waters, or um, voyage, uh, uh, voyage uh, details also uh, transfigured. And, um, and in all these, sometimes in critical areas like the Strait of Malacca, where, or, you know, Strait of Sunna, uh, were very critical areas where a, if a vessel stopped reporting could create an hazard at sea. So thank you and I hope that I have answered all your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mario. I, I would like to go to uh, Herman now. There are three uh, questions that are addressed to you, Herman. The first one is about political will. This is always a very complicated issue, political will. Uh, la voluntad política. Why is it so difficult to have Voluntad Politica to solve these issues. Is this a question by Gonzalo Correa? Correa. Uh, Guillermo Morán asks about the uh, multas, uh, about uh, the um, uh, tickets that are given to to the vessels in Costa Rica. If this are if these are very low, if las multas, if the punishments for for illegal fishing are very low, this would allow them to to keep on going, so las multas. Inestor Melo habla de la corrupción, corruption. Is this, a, in, in general, is how, how do you see the relationship between overall government and private corruption in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, this, in this matter? Okay, muchas gracias. Eh, con, con relación al tema de la voluntad política, Yo creo que sí existe, digamos, a través de la visión del Estado ha existido una voluntad política de atender el tema de la pesca IUU. Lo que sucede es que aquí hay una complejidad, como lo he explicado al inicio, entre lo que es el tema de la pesca artesanal y la pesca más pelágica, que es como la, la pregunta que hace eh, don Guillermo Morán con relación a las sanciones. ¿no? I, I think that the political will exists, but there is a com very complicated relationship between the political will and the capacity to enforce. And mm -hmm. so this has very much to do with the second question of Mr. Morang uh, of what sanctions look like. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the governments or state institutions want to, to proceed with the law, but they are uh, curtailed by these uh, other, other factors. Okay. Lo, lo, la, la voluntad ¿verdad? muchas veces está eh, sujeta a una serie de elementos adicionales que, eh, como explicaba a, ahora eh, don, don Mario, eh, requiere una definición política ¿verdad? a nivel de, de gobierno, pero también una serie de acciones ¿verdad? que requieren presupuestos y tecnología que se deben de implementar. Y eso en los países como Costa Rica o en la región, eh, pues tiene una serie de limitaciones. 
Uh, he, he believes that uh, political will has to express itself in the, uh, in the actions of governments, but these governments are limited by the technological and, and, uh, and other uh, aspects, costs uh, uh, related to, to controls that need to be established. And therefore, the, the political will, even when it exists, has limitations in how it, uh, it is established. It's operate, opera, operationalized. Con relación a las sanciones, hay que tener en cuenta que en el caso de Costa Rica, nosotros tenemos eh, una legislación que fuera de las 12 millas no permite establecer sanciones privativas de libertad y eso eh, genera una situación muy compleja para la persecución de los delitos de pesca fuera de las 12 millas por parte de embarcaciones extranjeras. In the case of Costa Rica, the Costa Rican legislation does not allow for prison for those who fish illegally beyond the 12 miles uh, of, uh, from the seashore. Mm -hmm. eh, y en el caso de las embarcaciones nacionales, eh, más bien hemos tenido un problema porque ha existido, eh, creo, considero, ¿verdad? una sobredimensión ¿verdad? de que la sola sospecha lo llevan a un proceso judicial que ha eh, paralizado y generado mucha resistencia por parte del sector pesquero a apoyar las políticas para eh, disuadir el tema de pesca IUU. And in the case of, of local residents or local vessels, uh, there is a lot of pushback on the part of the semi-industrial fleet that uh, oppose the, the uh, uh, possibility of uh, persecuting the IUUF. Mm -hmm. Con relación a, al tema de corrupción, eh, yo creo que Costa Rica ha avanzado mucho a través de los años. Digamos, hemos venido consolidando una plataforma de seguimiento satelital desde el Incopesca. Uh, Costa Rica has advanced quite a bit uh, with uh, satellite uh, prospection from mm -hmm. Incopesca, the national uh, fishing organization. Hemos venido estableciendo límites de captura. Hemos establecido una zonificación del mar para que puedan pescar en unos lugares las pe la pesca eh, de atún cerquera y otra la cerca de los longliners, los palangreros. Costa Rica has all established a maritime territorial mapping so that the zoning would allow for different kinds of fishing activities depending on, on those regions that have been mapped. Um, and uh, so there has been uh, some, some progress in that as well. Y, y, un, y un proceso paulatino en los que se han venido incorporando las embarcaciones, las longliners, las medianas y las grandes, al sistema de monitoreo satelit satelital que permite al Estado tener un control de dónde están pescando. Y entonces eso hace muy difícil los, cualquier tema de corrupción porque hay una visualización de dónde están pescando las embarcaciones. And also, it has been, there's been a gradual process of uh, satellite, uh, of, 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 uh, of satellites um, identification for these uh, longliners so that they uh, are easier to locate now and the corruption that was associated to them in the past has been reduced. Cuando han habido casos de embarcaciones cerqueras de posibles eh, pescas eh, que realizan sin tener licencia, Ha existido una dificultad institucional desde el Poder Judicial hasta el Poder Ejecutivo de poder entender la complejidad y la dinámica de la pesca. Y eso sigue persistiendo, esa necesidad de entender mejor cómo es esa dinámica. Bien lo explicaba don Mario de la necesidad de esa información inmediata, la coordinación. Y todo eso se hace muy complejo cuando hay que coordinar entre las instituciones y el Poder Judicial para poder establecer los procesos. ¿no? And then the other issue is the lack of coordination between the judiciary and the police authorities. There's lack of understanding, lack of information, as Mario uh, has, has said, there's a need for a better understanding between both so that these, uh, these issues can be moved on. Um, eh, y, y en el por último, en el marco de la Comisión eh, de, de Internacional, eh, de la Comisión de Atún Tropical, ITT, eh, ahí tenemos un tema, es que eh, hemos tenido muy poca capacidad para poder establecer las denuncias eh, en el marco ¿verdad? de la Comisión Interamericana de Atún Tropical, 
en el caso de barcos que se hayan visto pescando sin licencia. Entonces, ahí también se requiere poder generar una mayor capacidad para poder llegar con estas denuncias. And there's also a problem of taking information that can be, uh, that can, can be prosecuted at the tuna, uh, the Tropical Tuna Commission. So that, there's another area that needs to be highlighted. Thank you, thank you, Mario. Uh, thank you, Germán, very much. Amanda, I, I would like to, to go back uh, to you uh, in, in terms of uh, the work that Pew does. H how do you see your work as a large non-governmental institution, as a, a very respected institution, working with governments. Do you do you are you going to emphasize that in the in the coming years? Are you going to be working more with civil society? How, what's the blend? How how do you and and the private sector? How do you come bring all of those sectors together? Because you know one of the issues that we we were discussing in the first session was the the the, the key role that. The, pri the private sector has in in helping uh, the controlling of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Thank you. Um, so, so many angles there to respond. I will try and do so in a logical fashion. Our approach to this um, area of work um, and our institutional approach is very much to support the need for strong um, and good governance. Um, including uh, enforcement as needed. Our sense with international fisheries policy is that there are, despite um, the, the proliferation of fisheries agreements around the world, there are still significant holes across the governance chain and that those holes in fact are enabling and allowing illegal activity of a number of different kinds, as well as causing problems um, for good actors Um, and in fact, causing problems for industry. It is still not possible to go into um, a supermarket and look at any fish product on the shelf, any one of them, and be absolutely sure that there is no IUU activity associated with all of those. Now, that is something that from the perspective of these being Uh, public resources and uh, the high seas covering approximately 43% of the earth, that's an issue. We want to make sure that there is strong and good governance across um, the full kind of swathe of uh, fisheries management issues and associated issues. So our approach is to work on um, improving governance um, by emphasizing the importance of flag state responsibilities um, and seeking to particularly promote to governments the importance of things like making sure that they are providing oversight to all of the vessels that wear their flag, making sure they are requiring IMO numbers, making sure that they are keeping an eye on those vessels when they're in international waters as well as when they're in the waters of other coastal states at range of responsibilities. Um, we work on also promoting the importance of having so many, uh, having wide scale implementation of the port state measures agreement so that you do in fact get Um, the coverage, uh, the effective coverage that comes from closing many ports at once to actors who cannot actually prove that they have acted within um, their legal and appropriate responsibility. We also work at uh, ensuring that there is a scientific basis to fisheries management just from the environmental perspective. And we're also talking more to uh, industry, to fisheries industries and others about how the holes in um, effective governance at the moment actually put their uh, investments um, and at risk, both from the perspective of sourcing from places that don't have effective governance, as well as from the cost that industry then must um, shoulder in order to provide the traceability that civil society wants to see. So one of the reasons I think that this, uh, this particular issue becomes important to us is that If you look at it then in the bigger picture, fisheries enforcement is not just about preserving a country's fish stocks. When you look at it in the bigger frame, it's um, not even particularly about ensuring the viability of any one particular fish species. It's actually about preserving a valuable resource that has relationship to a country's national security implications. And for that reason, we work across the gamut from um, ongoing discussions uh, in fora such as these about 
the importance of knitting together various different forms of oversight and governance in a way that actually produces an outcome that's bigger than the sum of its parts. It's about helping industry to understand that um, they are in fact being let down in, the, in their ability to operate responsibly in the market by a lack of effective oversight and governance. Um, and it's about helping people to move beyond the idea that it's just a bunch of fish basically, and actually understand that what we're talking about is the basis of an international protein supply. It's the movements of goods and vessels around uh, the ocean in a manner that needs much greater oversight than has previously been provided. And it's about actually looking after both industry um, uh, industry and consumers to the point where we don't have to worry about what's happening um, on the vessels that catch the fish and to that fish before it arrives uh, to its final destination. So we see all of these stakeholders as having particular importance in this and we see fisheries governance as something far beyond an environmental issue. I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. Uh, th thank you so much. Uh, may, may I now go to you, Jonathan? Uh, can you refer to this issue of how technology can help with the tracing? But, but there's another one, another question for you from uh, or, or a question for from Andre Akush that you could probably refer to. It, it, it says the following, innovative technology and tech startups led, led the way in coming up with potential solutions to solving a great, to a great extent, IUU phishing. Are states and international organizations doing enough to support technology startups in this sector, financially or otherwise? If not, then what could be done about it? I think it's a great question uh, of looking at, at the future. And I would also like for you all to be thinking about a couple of concrete recommendations that you can make uh, for addressing some of these issues that we've been doing as we go towards the closing of this panel. Jonathan, your floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. I, um, I, I, I was going through the questions as well, and I, and I saw Andre's question, and it, ma it made me smile because, I, in part, I agree with his, his opening point um, around the, uh, the, the, the way in which tech startups are, are leading the way with potential solutions to solving IUU. But, but, I, but I would also say that, to, to an extent, and, I, and he does cover this later on in his question, more can be done about it, certainly. I think quite a lot of the innovation funding that we see coming from uh, developed nations focuses on a specific technology, a specific innovation, a specific uh, application, and it doesn't necessarily uh, have a, a full cognizance, a full awareness of the ecosystem that, in, that, that IUU really represents. And therefore, what you can see is, and as this isn't a, a criticism of the specific technology, but what you can see in many instances is let's have um, let's invent a, a, a drone with a longer range because that will be able to go out to sea and it'll be able to see further and then we'll understand more. What that doesn't do is, is consider the way in which the data that, that that asset, in this case, in this example, a drone, is collecting. It doesn't consider where it's going as data. It doesn't consider the evidence chain that it may or may not be contributing to. It doesn't consider the other data that it could be reconciled against. And as we've heard from Mario, AIS, which it, it, it could almost be mistaken for believing is a, uh, a counter IUU technology, but actually is a collision avoidance system. Um, it, 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 AIS standalone does not give us the complete maritime picture. It does not tell us everything that's happening at sea. It must be to extract its full value reconciled against other data sets. And so this ecosystem of data, this ecosystem of understanding, the actual practical application of these things within the, the, the production of, of evidence chains, within the production of decision-making that allows uh, accurate tasking of patrol vessels with people on board, the entire process of, of, of maintaining an understanding of an ocean space and enforcing governance within that ocean space um, is, is, where, is where innovation needs to be applied not just within single technologies. So, so, so whilst I agree with some of the points Andre's made, I do, I'm really pleased that he asked the question about what more can be done, because I think the innovation needs to be applied in the processes that allow the data to be applied. It needs to be, innovation uh, funding needs to be applied in the way in which that data becomes transparent so more people can benefit from it. And that will be uh, locally, regionally and internationally, because as that data is gathered, there are, there are facets of illegal phishing, as, as Amanda's highlighted, that, that contact other aspects of 
of, of the maritime space, but also the broader economic space. So illegal fishing is, 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 is in some regards symptomatic of the way financial structures are, are, are managed, the way investment is directed. You know, it, is a, it is ultimately an, a, an economic issue as well as an environment one, uh, environmental one, as well as a social one, as well as a people one. So I think that it, it, that's perhaps a long answer, but, but I would say uh, that, that that's the necessary consideration when innovation is being considered as a, as a, as a source for funding um, and a source for expertise and knowledge sharing is that the, the consider it as an ecosystem and, and innovate cognizant of that big picture, as Amanda used the phrase, rather than within the specific bounds of a given technology. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have addressed very well Captain Stephen Anderson's question on innovation, I think, following Mario's, Mario's remarks. I would like now to uh, almost close the panel, because all, again, we have run out of time, unfortunately, by requesting from you a couple of concrete recommendations that you would like to do. Un par de recomendaciones específicas de cuestiones que podrían resolver, eh, Germán, eh, el tema de pesca ilegal. Y vamos con usted eh, para empezar. Mr. Puchet. Bueno, eh, yo creo que en las dos perspectivas, en pesca artesanal y en pesca de palangre, son dos, dos, dos propuestas distintas. I think we pesca, have to make proposals differently from uh, the artisanal fishing and, uh, and long line fishing. En el caso de la pesca artesanal, es fundamental que el Estado avance en un modelo que logre integrar el conocimiento tradicional y científico para poder abordar junto a los temas sociales el tema de la gran cantidad de personas que pescan sin licencia. In the case of artisanal fishing and small-scale fishing, it is essential to combine traditional knowledges and, uh, and the scientific knowledge in order to uh, handle the question of people that fish without licenses. Y tiene que haber un proceso más transparente por parte del Estado a la hora de implementar los temas tecnológicos. Y el caso de Global Fishing Watch en Costa Rica es un caso eh, que pone en, en perspectiva el problema de una falta de transparencia, de no haber participado al sector cuando se quiere adoptar el tema de, de, de Global Fishing, al punto que el sector pesquero se, op se opuso y se sigue oponiendo al tema de Global Fishing Watch, pero no ha existido ningún acercamiento de Global ni del Estado para que se pueda conocer cuál es el alcance de esa tecnología. And then there's the other question, which is working together, the state with the sectors. Uh, this global uh, global fishing watch, for example, has been not has has not been implemented in Costa Rica, and in fact has been repealed by the fishing sector because there was no dialogue between the government, uh, the company, and and the sector regarding what were the conditions and the uh, opportunities that this offer. Which so so that that dialogue remains a, a very important uh, and needed action. Y en el sector de, de palangre en específico, digamos, la, la pesca más oceánica, creo que es fundamental que el Estado apueste a poder crear protocolos de actuación, tanto a nivel judicial como a nivel de CIAT, en el cual haya un mayor conocimiento de cómo se deben llevar a cabo los procesos y los requerimientos para que estos sean exitosos. And on the long line uh, fishing matters and pelagic fishing and all of that, uh, I think that it's very important to uh, improve the protocols that would allow the uh, Tropical Tuna Commission as well as the governments to transfer to the judiciary uh, institutions or to the international courts the, um, the evidence that would allow prosecutions to be successful. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Germán. Right. Mario, we go to you. A couple of suggestions. We probably have a hand, a bag full of them. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. President. Yes, this is a, th a theme that we could speak for five minutes or for five months. It's, <laughs> But I'll try to be brief. And before that, and before I address my final remarks, I would like just to acknowledge one thing, and it's in the form of information as well. It's uh, the, the Interpol, the, the, the project to the tier and stop the illegal fishing. It's actually a completely external funded uh, uh, project. And actually Pew was in the genesis of, of that. And it still is, it's still running 
some funds on this. So all the achievements that we have been uh, um, managed to, to, to achieve, sorry for the redundancy, um, throughout all these years was largely due to the, uh, 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 to the solidarity and uh, the engagement of Pew uh, with Interpol. And this is just to complete what when you're referring to uh, uh, inter -Pew, uh, to Pew uh, about their interaction, so the civil, uh, um, their interaction with the private sector. But just to say that actually they also interact with intergovernmental organizations such as uh, Interpol. I think it's more than fair to refer uh, to refer to that regarding and just in one uh, small sentence because I was looking through the scrolling uh, trolling through the, all the the questions there and apologies that uh, we could not uh, reply to all of them but there's a lot of uh, confusion between the uh, um, uh, enabling crimes and the associated crimes we tackle both we don't care for us it's it's uh, we have a saying that I actually I like to use it we throw them with all the books in the shelf follow the shelf itself if necessary. So that's our approach. I don't care if, uh, if I have a vessel that is in a port, but I do not have uh, an IU vessel that's in a port, but imagine is an IU vessel in Kamlar. So it has nothing to do with uh, the Atlantic. I will use any legal resources available to stop those vessels independently what it's the nature, as long as it's legal. Um, and uh, just to reinforce what Jonathan was saying, I really liked like his words in the way he wrapped up and saying, and just to highlight that, yes, AIS is not a silver bullet and actually none is a silver bullet. It's not the inspections in sport, it's not a silver bullet. AIS is not a, a, a silver bullet as well as inspections at sea are not a single bullet. It has to be this holistic and, and comprehensive way to tackle IU that uh, will enable us to be successful in, in this fight. As for the final remarks, I just have uh, uh, three and one to uh, specific to the uh, law enforcement community. Uh, transparency. Transparency is a key issue, particularly the regarding which vessels are licensed and which ones are not. This should be uh, an effort made by countries, put it online, it's quite easily these days to do that. Vessels registry, which vessels are, and for instance, I can refer to, I don't know, Honduras or uh, Bolivia, countries that, uh, that would not have that significant uh, fishing fleet, and they do have an online uh, website that we can often consult to uh, uh, com uh, understand whether those vessels are in fact resisted under their registry. Uh, fighting the corruption, joint teams. If I belong to a different team uh, from a different unit together in the same inspection, it will be very hard for me to trust that the other guys of the other agency will not blow uh, my cover or not blow my attempt to bribery. So this is one issue that we have seen in the field that when they are together, when agents are together, it's more difficult to enabling the, the corruption. So it's a very good way to do to, to this. And then obviously the corporation, everyone spoke about it. I allow me to go back again to corporation, but to corporation, but please do it in an effective, meaning provide all the information that was being requested and in a timely manner because if it comes too late in the space, it will be useless. And then for the law enforcement community, I'll leave just these three letters, A, B, C. Please, if you don't capture anything else other for my intervention, just please capture these, A, B, C. It's, a, it's a, a, an acronym that we use in investigation and intelligence and just stands for A, assume nothing, B, believe no one, and C, confirm everything. Those are key elements to be successful in your work. So forget about the, everything else and just keep that. And thank you very much once again for inviting us to, to be on this, on this panel. And congratulations, President, for, for your, your, your hosting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mario. Amanda, it's now your turn, uh, your take, your ABC of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. 
Um, so, of course, in my previous answer, uh, I failed to mention that we actually do a, a operate in a range of ways, including with Interpol. And I would say the two things that I would want to see go forward out of this is for ourselves as PU, we've had um, the honor of being involved in support to various uh, maritime security exercises and also uh, in sort of non-traditional ways working together with um, various military and security entities to look at how you integrate IUU operations into enforcement, border enforcement and maritime domain security. We'd like to continue to work in that way with willing partners and also together with educational institutions such as the Naval War College, whom we're speaking to at the moment and others to provide uh, support and capacity building to this broader cooperative effort Effort, um, cooperation being the word of the day. And my second uh, uh, recommendation would strongly be to continue at all levels to promote the uh, implementation of the Port State Measures Agreement as one of these sort of key, key tools. Um, so, and other than that, I can only echo Mario's uh, and Jonathan's kind of passion and suggestions on these various issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. And Jonathan, for the last word, uh, your two suggestions. That's, that's very kind. I've, 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 I've written down more than two. I'll consolidate. <laughs> go ahead. The, go uh, ahead. <laughs> we, need good, we need good ideas. <laughs> um, I, I'd say to, to all people at sea, the data you have for the specific use, you captured it, doesn't mean it's only useful to you. So I would recommend to people that they gather data and share it. Use data that you gather for many applications and i mean that not just in a be, be willing to share it and be willing to publish it and not not just internationally not just regionally but also nationally within governments share across departments because there are insights within one department and i can walk down a corridor and find another department further along that hasn't understood what the guys a few doors down are doing and that's that's not uh, any specific government anywhere in the world that's, that seems to be um, uh, a feature of, of many, many governments. So the opportunity to share data, uh, champion the sharing of data is, is what I'm saying. The other, the other thing to do, and I'd like to sort of think of this in a very positive way, we're always thinking about countering IUU. And actually, I think there's a really positive angle here in championing the, um, the understanding, the perspective that comes from legitimate fishing. It is an industry that feeds millions of people. It's an industry that employs hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world. It's a vital uh, industry for, for, for feeding the planet, uh, the protein source. And if governments and organizations, uh, entities, whatever you will, uh, industry can, can champion good quality fisheries management disciplines, it will isolate those that don't uh, adhere to them. It, it, will, it, will, it will create prosperous, long-term sustainable economic benefit from fisheries, and it will isolate and ostracize and diminish the impact that illegal fishing can have. So, so there's a really positive uh, note, I think, there to, to support the fishing industry that, that fishes legitimately, because it is a really important part of uh, the global food chain. Well, thank you so much uh, to, my, to all the panelists for their excellent presentations. We appreciate uh, your being with us, we're sharing your knowledge and your experiences with us. This. Um, um, panel comes to an end. I would like to re remind you that uh, the final, the third and final panel of this conference will begin at 12.15. You don't have to uh, leave this stream to watch, or you can refer to your email and, and, and come back whenever you, you wish. 12.15, the third session. And to all of you who have participated, who have visited from all over the world, thank you for joining us. And, uh, and again, to our panelists, thank you so much much success in your, your, all your activities. Take care, be well, and see you soon in the third panel.